It is one of the most commonly prescribed medications in the U.S., with an estimated 2.8 million patients per year. But a new meta-analysis published in the Journal of the American Medical Association suggests that Tamiflu may not actually significantly reduce the risk of hospitalizations from influenza. With more on this and other big medical news of the week, we are joined by our resident medical expert, board-certified ER doctor, Michael Danio. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does this effectively mean that Tamiflu just doesn't work? So, you know, we've had Tamiflu since 1999 when the FDA first approved it. Traditionally, we've given it in the emergency room and doctor's offices for two reasons. To um, prevent serious illness, prevent hospitalization, and possibly reduce the duration of illness by one day. We never really had great studies. Most of the original studies were from the manufacturer itself. So a lot of us in the medical establishment were a little bit wary of whether this actually did what it said it could do. It's now, as you mentioned, we have this system, systematic review, meta-analysis, which is the highest caliber study looking at 16 studies over 6,000 patients hmm. and it basically showed that for the general population Tamiflu does not reduce the risk of hospitalization from flu. So, there so we go. is there anybody who should be taking Tamiflu and if so who's that? So a lot of uh, doctors on Twitter in the last couple of days have been ready to just get rid of Tamiflu altogether and I think personally I think we should still reserve it for those who are immune compromised and people that have gotten a kidney transplant, for example, that whose immune systems don't really fight as well as everybody else. And so I still think there's a role for those patients to take Tamiflu. Okay. So it would help them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, another story we want to go to. A panel of advisors to the FDA unanimously recommended that COVID boosters should be updated for the fall, targeting only the newest, most dominant variants and dropping protection against the original COVID strain. What should we learn from this? What, what's the big takeaway here? So as you remember, the original vaccine included the original strain. And then last summer when they had this meeting, they decided that for the fall, it was going to be a bivalent, meaning it would include the original strain and BA4-5. But by the time the winter rolled around, COVID had already mutated substantially. So I think the FDA advisors this year had a much easier time because in the last few months, we've just seen this very stable antigenic drift in the XBB variant only, meaning that as each new variants come along, they're only different from the previous one by one or two amino acids. And so it gives us um, some, uh, some, a lot of hope that for this fall, the strain that we chose will match what's going to be prevalent. So I think the big question now for the CDC's me next meeting next week is who they're going to recommend be updated with the vaccine, whether it's going to be a blanket recommendation or just those high risk and those over 65. And whether it's going to become an annual like the flu vaccine. Right. I think they've sort of teed us up that is going to be annually. They okay. want to roll this out along with the with the flu vaccine. And I hope, you know, d d down the line, we may be able to get both at the same time, like within the same shot. So that would be really great. OK, well, this is stunning, uh, especially if you're going to travel to mm. Mexico. A new report from the LA Times shows that pharmacies across Mexico, including in tourist hotspots like Tulum and Puerto Vallarta, they're selling counterfeit pills over the counter with more and more of them testing positive for fentanyl. This is shocking because right. Dr. D, they said that more than half, I think, or half of those pills tested included fentanyl. I mean, kudos to the LA Times reporters for this expose. I mean, they did a great job. And as you said, you know, we're all kind of shocked by this. And, you know, my take home from this was I have a substantial amount of patients uh, at St. Joe's in Burbank who are Latino that continue to travel to Mexico because they have their, their trusted primary care doctors there. They don't have insurance here. It's easier and mm -hmm. less expensive for them to do that. The issue is they're getting their prescriptions from Mexican pharmacies, which don't have the same level of quality assurance mm -hmm and manufacturing uh, requirements that we do here. And so there's very high risk that you're going to see this cross-contamination with fentanyl, for example. And you tell them that, I assume, and say be careful. Yeah, and I think that, you know, I understand the cost savings, but I think, you know, when it comes to prescriptions, when they come back here, they should look at other options, even if they don't have insurance. Good RX, Costco provide very good discount pharmacy services, which are, you know, may run them a little bit more money, but certainly cheaper in the long run. Yeah, I was just in Cabo on vacation. I was right. kind of amazed at how many pharmacies yeah. there are everywhere mm -hmm. there. And clearly there's big business there, especially for tourists. And it could be deadly, yeah. like deadly business. All right, Dr. Michael Daniel, always great to see you. Thanks Thank for you coming in. Thanks, we appreciate Doctor. him as our Fox 11 medical correspondent once a week.